to Jonah chapter 2, where the prophet writes these words, or the words about the prophet are written. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful and thankful for the fact that salvation comes from you. Father, may we also understand, not only in our times of despair, but every day, that our hope is not in the low places, but in your high holy temple may we turn to you and be committed to the message that salvation comes from you and you are our only hope may we turn from you when life and sin has entangled us and may we put our hope in you and be thankful that based on what christ did we know that that's possible father we pray that the words that are said now and the time that's been spent in worship this morning is for your honor and your glory in christ's name we pray amen we are in the book of jonah and you may remember a couple of years ago, we preached Jonah before. So let's just recap for a moment. When we encounter Jonah this morning, he's in a situation where he is sunk in. He is honestly about as low as you could get. Well, he's just been a little bit lower. Remember chapter one, the first verse, God says to Nineveh, go. Jonah instead goes the opposite direction to the city of to the city of Joppa with the idea of going to Tarshish, which is his way of saying to God, no. Then he gets up on his ship where I'm sure the sailors say, yo, ho, ho, because that's what every sailor I've ever seen in a movie says. I assume that's just sailor talk. As they begin to leave on the journey, the wind then begins to blow. The sea begins to roar and things become very hassled and troubled for this crew. So they start to try to lighten the load and survive the storm by throwing over all the cargo. Stick with me. I know this is lame. All right? And as they're sticking the cargo in the ocean, it doesn't seem to help. At this point, Jonah tells them who he is, and he's a prophet of God. He was supposed to go somewhere else. And his solution is, as the wind is blowing and the cargo has been throwing, that really who needs to be thrown is me. But these soldiers, or these sailors start to think through the idea. If this is a God who can destroy their boat in the middle of a storm, the last thing they really want to do is throw Jonah overboard because they don't want any problem with God. So they say, whoa, 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 we're not going to do that. Instead, they get out their rows and they try to row, row, row the boat back towards the shore. And as they row closer to the land, the storm gets stronger as a sign this is not the way to go. So finally, they have the conversation, they begin to talk to Jonah, and they say to God, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Before we do what we're about to do, we want you to understand that we do not want to be accountable for if this man dies. They say to God, let his sin be upon him, not upon us, and then they finally relent to what Jonah says, and then they do take the prophet, and it's him who over the rail gets throw wind and then as he's sinking down along comes the giant fish or the whale or some other great creature depending on your interpretation and the whale does the final o of our chapter as he takes a giant swallow and that's where we encounter jonah in chapter two here he is under the water sunken for the first time completely understanding his despair the reality is is what jonah experiences is what all of us experience at some point in our lives this is the principle of sin 
Sin allows us to find ourselves running in the opposite direction of God. We talked last week when we sang at the end of the sermon, or we quoted at the end of the sermon, Rock of Ages, that cleft for me, let it be for us the double cure of sin. Sin has two powers over us. The first one is the power of separation, that it keeps us separated from God. And that Jonah has already demonstrated that by leaving his hometown and not going in the direction and following the commands of God, but he's committed a sin and he's gone the opposite way. What God has commanded, he does not do. And that's the first thing that sin has for us. It begins to cause the problem for us. It separates us from God. But Jonah, by being sunken or falling through the water, shows us the second thing that sin does. It doesn't just have the ability to separate us from God. It begins to have a power over us. It has a moral corruption. It has that ability that takes what we were created to be and makes us something else. It makes us a lesser. It takes us from people who were created, like all of you were, to truly root for Indiana University. And because sin is involved, you begin to root for Purdue. See, I can say that this week because nobody's going to hit me at the end of the service for it, and I'm sure somebody will get me next week. But the idea is, sorry, it's not a moral equivalent on which basketball team you choose. There's just one that clearly there's a sign of God's blessing. But the idea is, is that's what sin does. Sin has the moral corruption to make us do the things that God has not commanded and then be powerless or not only powerless, we then crave the exact opposite of what God does. The symbolism of what sin does is seen here in the prayer of Jonah. Look again in chapter 2. Notice what he said. As I was going to the depths of the grave, I was surrounded by... By seaweed wrapped around my head, I went down about as far as you can. To the root of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. It's referred to as a pit. The idea is for Jonah is the same thing that happens to us when sin begins to take hold in our lives. It brings us down and the more we try to struggle against it, the more power it can have over us. Unless something can deliver us. One of the ways we've illustrated this in the past, if you took the salvation class, is when we use the imagery of the bridge, we talked about the idea that sin is not just a ravine underneath, but really it's a ravine with something like quicksand above the top. Before you fall into that bottomlessness in the pit, the quicksand will, as you try to fight out of it on your own, it'll just drag you farther down. That's why sin is so powerful. That's what makes sin so problematic. That's also why the prophet needs to go to Assyria and to the Ninevites in the first place. Because if there's any more dastardly dudes in the first century or in the early centuries of B.C., it's these guys in the 7th, in the 8th, 9th, and 7th centuries or the 9th, 8th, and 7th centuries. Their sin has so encumbered them that their concept of human life is degraded. The ability to treat people the wrong way is degraded. And we like to think that sin has that kind of power over those kinds of people. But, it, you know, maybe for us it's not so severe, which is sometimes why we have a harder time listening to what God calls of us as well. But if you'll notice, this same imagery is used by the king after God's own heart. In Psalm 69, David says this in verses 1 and verse 2, Save me, O God. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am sinking and there's nothing I can do about it. The water is more than I am tall. I can't get any imagery. When I was in the fifth or sixth grade, I can't remember which now, we had a party at the end of our 4-H season at the 4-H director's house. And what he had was a giant ingrown pool. Now, that's extremely exciting for those of you who, A, like water, or B, can swim. But you got to go along with it because, you know, it's what everybody else in 4-H is doing. And it's our big year-end celebration. So everything was cool for me when I was in the three-foot water. <laughs> but as the larger crowd gets in and you kind of have to move your way around the pool a little bit, I realized I had gotten to a point where I could no longer touch bottom. I, again, am not like those of you who enjoy water or can swim. So as I grabbed onto an intertube, 
I think the girl in the inner tube thought I was trying to be cute. So what she did is she pushed me away. And I understood what David was saying here because there was no foothold. Instead, what there was, was there me going down once <laughs> and then because of buoyancy coming back up and then going back a second time. <laughs> and then I remember the attempt for the third time. David is saying that's what sin does. It can bring us and it will bring us to death and despair. And why? Why, David, do you need to be saved? Verse 5 is the key. You know my folly, O God. My guilt is not hidden from you. The reality is, unless something else intervenes for David, he's done. He is a sinner. The truth of Jonah begins the proto-gospel, if you will. The reality is, as Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short. There needs to be some hope, someone who can pull us out. Like the high school student in FFA or in 4-H that pulled me out on before the third go-round. I don't even know if anybody else at the party noticed it, but it's the thing that I will remember forever. <laughs> because without it, there wouldn't be a videotape, there wouldn't have been the last six years with you, and my family's life would have been a little different had their boy been found at the bottom of a swimming pool to end his 4-H year. There's got to be some sense of hope that needs to come. But now for Jonah, that's his only hope as he's been sunken. His, the, uh, the hope that we've sung of many times before. Remember the song? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. No way to get a foothold, no hope very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. That's where Jonah was when the whale swallowed him. And now in chapter 2, as the prayer continues, we begin to see that he's not just sunk in, but the situation is starting to sink in. The situation is starting to sink in. Jonah begins to understand that the reason the whale came about is because of the one who sent the whale. Notice the verse says in chapter 1, and God gave a big fish to swallow Jonah. The Lord provided a great fish. Verse 10, the Lord commanded the fish, and Jonah got to go flying out in a deep heave of vomit onto the land. There's a pretty image, isn't it? Jonah has begun to experience not just the part where he was sinking deep in sin, but the reality and the fact that the master of the sea heard the despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. In the prayer, we see four things that Jonah begins to see that sinks in about this process of salvation. Number one, the concept that God is just, and this will deal with his righteousness. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for your help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas. The current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. And I said, notice this, I have been banished from your sight. I have been banished from your sight. It's not the idea that Jonah has been picked on that causes God's judgment to come upon him. The wrath of God is a just wrath. Because if God is righteous and God is holy, then the only thing that he can do when his holiness meets sin is he has to punish it. Or he's not a righteous God. This is the simple understanding of justice as we know it. Anytime we've ever been treated unjustly by a parent or by a teacher or by a police officer, we've felt that system saying there's got to be something greater than this. Wrongdoing cannot go unpunished. It's at the center of our core understanding and belief as people. Jonah begins to understand that God allowed this to happen to me not because of something that he just chose to do, but because of something we deserve. He understands this idea of justice and righteousness. 